John Russell grew up on a cattle ranch situated miles outside of two tiny Texas towns. Unlike most kids in the county, growing up on Stanger Ranch meant feeding cows on cold Christmas mornings, riding horses through rain and woods, repairing barbed wire fences, and knowing the monotony of mowing pastures all summer. But like everyone who grew up in Brazoria County, I breathed air so thick with religion, there was no doubt the second coming was only a few church potlucks away. <laughs> and sure, I love being at Bethel Presbyterian Church, asking every question about the ancient book that I could think of. But when you're 14, little old Bethel couldn't hold a candle to the cultural center that was first Baptist. <laughs> and because all my friends were Baptists, all of my friends, and their church had goateed youth leaders with big budgets, I was constantly asking my parents to drop me off in front of that colossal red brick building at the center of town. And so Wednesday night, I was writing down my sins and nailing them to an actual old rugged cross. <laughs> Summers, we got to meet up with youth groups of approved theology. Once, we had the pleasure of knocking on doors, dripping in sweat from the nerves and the Texas heat, and invited people to church. Our youth leaders in their khaki shorts and Jesus sandals looked on with pride as we stumbled over our lines. But spring... Spring was my favorite. The approach of Easter meant the annual passion play. <laughs> now, Patrick Evans, I may need every one of your Broadway references with a blank stare, but I have seen how fancy lighting, well-produced dance numbers, a booming chorus, and a shirtless man can save souls. <laughs> for years, and once they even gave the Presbyterian a single line. <laughs> I went back week after week, praying and singing, raising my hands occasionally to make it really count. <laughs> but I never felt at home there. I was out of place, the stranger. That queer kind of strangeness where you're a stranger in the midst of the people that are supposed to be your people. So when the lights were dimmed for prayer, and we were invited to turn ourselves over to Christ, I was looking around wondering if the others were as uncomfortable as me. Because when they asked me, are you saved, John? All I heard was, are you gay? It would have to be one or the other. Because God is holy, and only the holy can be with him in heaven, and there is only one other option. That's what I thought I knew. That was the vision in my head as I tried to sleep every night. I'm guessing Peter knew what it felt to be the stranger. From his time with Jesus to the planting of his 1001 worshiping community. <laughs> He'd probably become numb to showing up in town after town, where he knew only a few people at most. It's exhausting being the outsider. I'm guessing Peter and his company of new church developers are run ragged when we meet them in tonight's text. It's no surprising that it's not surprising that it takes stopping to pray to realize how hungry he is, and judging by the trance he enters, he may have skipped more than one meal. Peter's vision is simple and clear. A sheet holding animals of all kinds, clean and unclean, lowers from heaven. And despite his light-headed hunger, when God tells him to eat from this Noah's Ark 2.0, Peter actually says, by no means. Though the voice of God says otherwise, Peter is certain of what it means to be Christian, to be holy. My visions and certainty as a young gay boy were just as strong as Peter's, and I'm guessing many of you survived them as well. But we, 
We are here because we've learned what Peter learned on that roof. That we must not call profane what God has made clean. We are here surrounded by these majestic mountains because we are committed to building a church that reflects God's heart, that sees the sacred in every child of God. We are here to be refreshed and rejuvenated in the work because we will not rest until every trans, lesbian, bisexual, gay, and queer youth grows up knowing without a doubt they are good yes. and beloved by God, the church, and the whole world. That's right. Amen. Our calling is far from complete. Queer and particularly trans youth still face extreme rates of homelessness, assault, and suicide. It is no wonder that there are so many communities like us working to make sure that no LGBTQ youth lies awake at night with visions of flames. You may have heard about an online media project that launched earlier this month. It's called Not All Like That Christian. And it's a website that hosts videos of numerous people, mostly white, straight allies, delivering a simple message in their own words. Not all Christians believe that lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer people are unworthy of God's love. And LGBTQ youth need to hear that God loves them as much as possible through every avenue possible. And the church has the responsibility of speaking up and healing the hurt that has been done in its name by calling and treating queer people as sacred. The Not All Like That, or NALT project, has joined its voice with ours in making sure that we no longer live in a world where the good news is hidden. But I'm afraid the NALT project reveals something hidden about our own movement for inclusion. Well. At the beginning of the summer, on the Upper East Side of Manhattan, a setting that 14-year-old rancher's son, John Russell, could have never dreamt he'd reference in a sermon. <laughs> <laughs> I had lunch with Mika Vandersall, who is my boss and warrior queen for all us queer future pastors, and Carmen Fowler-LaBerge, executive editor of The Lincoln, a publication that serves the interests of the far-right Presbyterians. You may have heard of it. <laughs> Y'all, this lunch felt about as bizarre as it sounds. <laughs> and then not. I sat at the table with Carmen and Mika and listened to two women leaders, something that wouldn't have happened just two decades ago, connect over their shared experiences as heads of organizations and their respective movements. And over that shared meal, we each clarified what was really important to our ministries, what excited us, frustrated us, saddened us. It was one of those moments where genuine conversation and dialogue rise above abstract politics and theologies. It was the kind of experience that reminds me that the spirit is alive and well and very mysterious. In all our sharing, one thing pierced through my cynical generalizing about the far right in the church. Carmen told us that many conservative Presbyterians now relate more to other conservative Christians than they do to their own Presbyterian family. They have a feeling of being deeply out of place, strangers in their own denomination. This makes me incredibly sad. I've known what it feels like to exist as a stranger in the midst of the people that are supposed to be my people. And I know I'm not alone in this. We have each lived through the experiences of feeling like a stranger to ourselves, our families, our churches, and even the love of God. We have also felt what it means to belong to the Presbyterian family, that almost indescribable sense of community when you meet with Presbyterians from, when, from anywhere in the world, that sense of Eucharist as we gather together. As someone who loves that connection, that feeling of home that, men, that many of us have in the church, to know that so many people have lost that 
brings me no joy. Now let me be clear, I am not here to gloss over conservatives' contribution to the world sin of oppressing and abusing queer people because they see us as less human, less sacred, less worthy. My story and many of yours and those that you love are of survival of this very oppression. My calling and your callings are to create a world that reflects God's love of the stranger. Sometimes separation is necessary, even best, especially when there has been too much hurt. And I've said myself, just let them go. But the pain of divorce, of estrangement, cuts deep. And we must still grieve, because the pain of others does nothing to heal our own. So what Carmen shared with me grants me no joy and no reconciliation. It was that lunch, my work with LGBTQ youth, my own childhood, that flooded my mind when I witnessed the launch of the Not All Like That project. While well-intentioned, these videos by queer-loving Christians don't actually move beyond our Peter-like need to categorize people as profane or sacred. They simply relocate the categories. Dirty Christians are those who are responsible for all that has been done and said against LGBTQ people and clean Christians are those of us picking up the pieces. If only it were truly that simple. Maria is a 17-year-old leader in her youth group. Maria's multicultural, bilingual Brooklyn church has not taken formal steps to become a Preswelcom Covenant Network or my, More Light Church, and probably won't for a while, if ever. In Nalt's book, they are those other Christians. But Maria came to me recently, tasked as the preacher for her youth Sunday, and she told me she knew of people afraid to come to her church, because they are gay, and asked for help addressing this in her sermon. So we worked on it together and celebrated afterward, when her congregation, for the most part, received the gospel and Maria with open arms. Maria's church isn't putting a rainbow flag on their sign tomorrow. Isn't even ready to say that being LGBTQ is good. But they aren't like that either. They are listening and growing. Nall puts into place a paradigm where others are either with us or against us. This kind of framework attempts to recreate Carmen, Maria, and many others as strangers. My friend Allison Amex, who is here tonight, queer advocate and senior editor at Believe Out Loud, said it best. It distances us from people I love. People like some of my extended family members, compassionate and loving Christians, who still believe my gayness is not God's best for me. I am not comfortable putting these Christians in the same category as extremists like Pat Robertson. Like Allison, I'm uncomfortable with not Nalt because I believe it is reductionistic, but also for one very pragmatic reason. What we have gained, what we have won since our more inclusive ordination standards is not an entire denomination. What we have lost are too many conservative faith communities into which queer children are being adopted, born, and raised without hearing they are beloved. Turning our back on conservative Christian communities is a non-option. But finally, I am uncomfortable with saying we are not all like that because it's a lie. Our confession-loving reform tradition reminds us that we are, all of us, always broken. We never get it completely right. We never escape participation in systems of injustice. How many pastor nominating committees of welcoming churches, when presented, when presented with a sheet from heaven, 
full of incredible, gifted, queer pastors have called a straight one. Many of our congregations haven't even begun to think about hospitality to transgender people. And the inclusive movement of the Peace USA has ignored the particular concerns and struggles of queer people of color far too much. We, we are racist, we are sexist, we are transphobic. Yet in Christ, we have been redeemed. We are, all of us, beloved and called sacred by God. We are holy because Christ is holy. We remain human, beloved children of God, no matter what. So if being like that is being like Carmen, being vulnerable with strangers whom she believes should not be leading the church, if being like that is being like Maria, unsure what sin has to do with all of this, but confident that queer people should be welcome in her church. If being like that is being like Peter, constantly discovering that in Christ there are no longer categories of sacred and profane. Yes. If being like that means never getting it entirely right, but being held in divine love all the way through it, then thank God we are like that.